Let's talk random archaeology episode 10 with myself, Professor Howard Williams. And me, Afnan Ezeldin. Hello, welcome back. Can you believe it, Afnan? 10 episodes of Let's Talk wow. Random Archaeology. It's flown Absolutely by. Absolutely crazy. It, it is has. Crazy. It really has. And we are now into the realm of our latest a sort of review of a recent peer reviewed academic publication on some aspect of the archaeology on heritage of death and memory and we're going to be going back yeah. to South America and back to the journal Antiquity and we're in volume mm. 95 384 pages 1405 to 1425 and it's a research article called Relational Bodies Affordances Substances and Embodiment in Chinchorro Funerary Practices circa 7000 to 3250 BP and this is an article therefore about uh, the Peruvian South American Peruvian uh, coastal communities yeah. of the, the the 7th millennium BP 5th millennium BC through to the sort of 2nd millennium BC fourth millennium bp oh god bp bc bce who can you know it's all confusing but it's about um south american prehistory right and yes. the authors are indira mont uh, daniel fiore uh calgero uh, um santoro and bernard bernardo ariazza and uh, they are investigators from chile and argentina and um they've written a brand new peer-reviewed piece on the chinchiru charo funerary practices and so this, these are world famous as the earliest recorded evidence of mummification even dating yeah. earlier than egyptian mummification practices and therefore they always hit the headlines we've got lots of articles about these um in scientific uh you know publications analyzing the mummies themselves and we've yeah. also they appear in many of the popular books in mortuary archaeology you know which is always packed full of mummies and grisly deaths and so people on at one level we know a lot in the popular culture about the chinchorro mum, um, mummies but really this is a paper that brought, brings together the latest evidence for their dating and their variability and how we can therefore match the dates the radiocarbon dating with the um with the the detail of all these mummies many of them in museums to to actually give an up-to-date synthesis of what we know about the chinchorro yeah. mummies and so if i may read out their abstract to give everyone a sense of what yes. the article is about do you think that'd be a good way to start? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Funerary art has has the body as its main material component, expresses responses to death, and offers insight into relationships between the living and the dead. Chinchorro hunter-gatherer fisher societies along the Atacama Desert coast provide a key example of such connections, having developed one of the world's oldest known systems of post-mortem body transformation. A study of 162 modified Chinchorro bodies identifies diachronic changes, in other words, changes over time, <laughs> but that's one of those words uh, that particularly North American archaeologists love and everyone else has to deal with. Diachronic changes in these practices, including a decrease in internal stuffing. I always like an a decrease in internal stuffing, unless I'm very full. Sorry, I'm, 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 I shouldn't be commenting on this. I should be reading it seriously. Adding invisible contents that created corporeal volume. In other words, stuffing. Um, yes. and an increase in external bodily treat body treatment that created visible features. So less stuffing, more covering. The yes. authors proposed that such manipulation was a meaningful form of social embodiment designed to construct a collective identity. So that's the abstract. That's what they say their mm -hmm. article is about. And uh, um what do we make of this then, Afnan? This is a, obviously a brand new study. It's 2021, so it's a, yeah, as good as brand new in academic Jesus. terms. And it provides a really up-to-date synthesis I can give to students and that introduces this material and, and gives us the latest information about its geographical and, um, you know, yeah. material components. So, but beyond that, what do we make of their argument that, that, that this actually 
we, we can we can see Chinchoro mummification as a form of embodiment, creating a collective identity. Um, it's a fully loaded question. <laughs> um, actually, no, I, I think it's a very interesting concept and the way in which well, if we just go through, like, um, I guess the structure. So, like, they begin by talking about, and um, they give us some background on on the mummies and, you know, like the the hunt gatherer fishing societies that basically that we're talking about throughout the throughout the paper. And they do focus on um, three things that they do want to, you know, like look at over the course of the paper. And it's actually quite interesting. So. Um, they start by talking about like funeral archaeology, art, and like the, you know, I guess um, what it is about changing a body that makes yeah. it one interesting, two important, and three maybe society like socially um, different or like yeah, yeah. Um, and how you know like how these body transformations are basically not just social constructs, but they are also art, or I guess not just art, but also social constructs as well. Yeah. Um, they go. They then go through like the the case study of uh, Chinchoro, and it is very interesting because um, it's a really beautiful place. Just I might add that in yeah. a very very pretty um, area to be looking at. I'd love to um, go dig in there, um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's not really the point. Um, but yes, no, so they continue by going through um, that their materials, what they found, and it is actually really interesting because it was basically, what is it, 21% of all of their materials found were dressings uh, yes. on the bodies, which is super cool. I think it's super cool. Um, usually it's, well, not usually, but it is often grave goods or, you know, things that are buried with um, as extra, I guess these dressings are yeah. maybe extra as well, but you know, it's still very, um, it's different to other burials. Um, and after that, they kind of just continue, they go through the results and they show us what they found. And it's very interesting what they found. They have lots of different, um, well, materials. They've got wigs, they've got masks, they've got all these different kinds of clays. And um, I guess just a combination of both human an animal and natural not that humans and animals are not natural yes um, but you know yeah you know what i mean kind of like and the body itself and... you know the human but yeah yeah exactly um and it's a great it's a really it's an awesome site very very interesting with lots of information and really well structured as well um but yeah that i think like that's kind of basically the run through of that then they go of course go into that discussion which i do want to discuss with you so Okay. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, the the thing I find, um, I mean, they do frame this in relation to mortuary archaeology theory and the work of on the body, including Joanna Safair and also uh, Chris Fowler, and they say that you know cr changing the body by stuffing, managing it, and then you know yeah. um, preserving it in this way is 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 a manipulation producing a hybrid relational body, a quote individual person whose interaction with the environment and the living resituated him or her in another social dimension. So but this goes back to Robert Hertz's sociological approach to death, really, which Chris Fowler has taken forward. But Chris has taken very much um, taking it via anthropological work on the individual body and mashed it together with Robert Hertz in a really interesting way and applied it to European later prehistory but here they're taking those ideas and applying them again to the chinchoro mummies now that is both really i think really exciting but also really abrupt and botched in some ways because what they what they don't really explain is if like when you're dealing with a dead body whether you're simply yeah. bur burying it the same day next day in a in a shroud or you know just completely well, naked as it was you are still by those very simple abrupt funerary practices creating a new relationship between the dead body and its environment and that may be simply an earth cut grave that may be simply a pile of a small little um cross or, or marker on the surface you are making a, a new identity from that corpse you're yeah. mixing the corpse with the, you know, associated the corpse with a particular burial environment, a particular above ground structure or none, or the choice not to is, is so even those most abrupt and simple of practices or even just abandoning a person to die on their own in a cave and, and, and or in the middle of the desert is a choice to transform that identity 
into something new. And so uh, right the way through to the the full most elaborate what we think of as the most elaborate funeral rituals are trying to preserve the body through mummification we can also see that as a form of transformation on that point i totally agree but then but their claim that in their abstract here which is absolutely false um and this is where they they get run into problems i think is they claim that mummification or this at the chancharo uh funerary practices they call it funerary art which is a really yeah. ambiguous term because almost anything can be funerary art from murals on a church too. wall to, 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 to a piece of jewellery. So I don't know that really gets us anywhere. But they are trying to emphasise artifice, the act of creatively transforming the body, making yeah. some... But in that sense, it's art, but it's not... They don't clarify that. But they say that um, it's the old world, oldest known system of post-mortem body transformation. Well, my, I would argue that's totally bogus. And if anything, you could make an argument that burying the dead body in a shallow grave is the oldest or cremating the dead which goes back at least the upper paleolithic um and in fact actually some of the early dates from australasia you could be arguing middle paleolithic um for 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 cremation um my point would be um it's the oldest form of mummification but they seem to be confusing mummification with all funerary rituals and then uh, because they're doing that, they're not making clear how mummifying, how these very specific cultural practices of stuffing the body, you know, uh, creating a, a, a long term enduring identity for the body yeah. is something very special and different from just yeah. any form of bodily transformation. It's not normal in the same way as embalming the dead in yeah. modern Western funerals is not normal. It's a very distinctive very it's not just oh it's transforming the body it's a very distinctive choice to preserve the body with a specific set of pro- substances and for me that then then leads them into a quandary of what then to say that's specific because all they end up saying is well this is about transforming the dead and creating a hybrid identity of stuff and corpse yeah. and preserving it and that creates a collective identity but whose collective identity what collective identity if it's a, they're emphatic it's not about that individual then where yeah. whose identity is this? Is this is this a is this a clan based identity? Is it a community identity? Is it a, a community of ancestors? As when you're mixing up two um, bodies in tombs in in parts of the world where you have those collective funerary rites. When they say collective, it seems contradictory because collective surely means you're merging the dead individuals together. Where here they're actually preserving the individual through transformation mm-hmm. and, and all kinds of mummification is not about preservation in the sense of retaining as was it's about transforming the dead into a, a durable set of compositions of, of, of art if you like so yeah. right okay i get them but they end, never end up telling us well what's so specific why does it change and why does it why does it start why does it go on why does it change and then why does it end it's just oh it's about collective identity so for me it's a wonderful synthesis but they never get to an explanation that is anything that you couldn't apply to any period any place about any funerary ritual it's all about transformation to create an identity for the dead right but why and how in that way why are you burning the bodies on a platform why are you exposing the dead on on a hillside why are you burying the dead in a communal cemetery why are you deciding to mummify bodies you never get a story that you couldn't actually cut and paste from anywhere else around the world and that is really frustrating when they've put presented so much rich detail um yeah, so that's yeah. my rant about why i thought this paper was fantastic but also left me wanting more I totally feel that and I do get where you're coming from but I must say that like um I don't know I quite I liked I really liked that they called it funerary art and not funerary oh, yeah. practice I do think that the like because you said it was vague and it is a little but I do like that because I mean at the end of the day we don't really know much about much <laughs> no, um, we don't really get a sense of the performances and how these were part of any ceremonies we don't get a sense of the, where these were being buried we they never talk about the funerary context no, yeah, um, no. and they don't really explain what potential connotations or meanings are attracted to these particular substances that are being used to you know comp- compose the animal fibers the, the you know the the materials were they trying to dress the dead in a 
as they were at particular stages in their life or as they imagine ancestors would be or they imagine deities were dressed. Uh, yeah, you know, but... There's lots of options there that I wish they'd at least presented and mused over, even if we can't come to a conclusion. Definitely. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. But I do think that like it's we when we talk about like the they're talking about the social um like everyone being one it's a social entity we're not individuals and yes they are individual bodies and they are being mummified but when we think about it like let's take a look at some of the evidence that they provided so um a lot of the the finds that they have they have clay masks they've like um painted them over with either red or black in some cases some in very later stages sometimes green um paints it's to cover oh in my like yeah so it's to cover the the face it's to kind of almost to of course preserve but almost to cover an identity and they all yeah. would look the same and it is they have the same they have the same wigs they have the same clothing there is a hide that they then use later on and they don't know whether it was brought in as like during the stage that they're talking about all later on but it is to make each individual body look the same so it is a very interesting concept that like even while they are individuals unlike let's say um ancient egyptian like mummified bodies every like each one has this beautiful like cast and it's not really a casket but like it's glorious and there's so many different like colors and stuff and it is it is to make you special whereas i feel like in this situation that's not really the point of the whole mummification process it is to make you the same so but they don't say that you say that um no, yeah. they don't they them <laughs> and i like that I, I i i wish they had been more forthright in making that argument but they they almost get there but they say um in the conclusion uh, each body is unique. Recurrent patterns in the transformation that are independent of age and gender were neither intended to emphasize the deceased person's individuality nor their status. So they're not about the individual, they're asserting, but they don't say that there's an attempt to make the dead look like, despite age yeah. and gender, the previous interment, the previous person. Because if they tied this into this long lasting tradition, that you're actually you're able to go into these burial facilities, see ancient mummies yeah. and add new mummies to it if they'd made those arguments if they if the archaeological contextual evidence is available for that that would really have helped to make their case that look what these people are trying to do is make the new dead look like the ancient dead and continue yeah. this tradition of almost transforming the dead into an ancient you know ancestral form or not if ancestral is not the right term uh, of a similar form so sameness or, or para not parity um, because it's not necessarily making them identical but making a, a connection a, a citation to an earlier body that they can encounter in the same tomb that would have really helped to build that argument that what this is about is a collective identity where the newly dead emerge with the older dead which is very much what say Maurice yeah. Block has argued for the marina of Madagascar which are ideas which were heavily stolen and applied to the European Neolithic and that would have been really interesting, but they 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 didn't quite get there. So I think you're right. That's what they're trying to get at. I think that yeah. I, I, I didn't quite it didn't quite come out. It's just said in, in their final sentences in these earliest known funerary art expressions, which again, if they clarify what they mean by funerary art, they could bolster that claim that this is the earliest evidence of body modification, which is rubbish, yeah. um, but it's, it's specifically body <laughs> corporeal mummification or whatever terminology. If mummification is too Egypt, Egyptian centric or Egypto centric, then what, you know, what other term are we using here? So I don't think they're clear. They say then non-human substances were key elements in the intentional intervention of heads and torsos, allowing artificially treated chinchorro bodies to transcend their human lifetimes symbolically yeah. right so there they seem to be suggesting that this is about preserving that corpse as an an identity as, as some kind of identity go, moving onwards yeah, symbolically yeah. but that that is not an identity that person holds that is a state of being that is linked to others previous uh corpses that have been on the same journey so they are seeming to yeah, hint yeah. some kind of why don't they just say eschatological understanding? Why don't they talk about afterlife? Why don't they talk about ancestors? They won't talk about those terms, but they're happy to bandy around Chris Fowler's 
relational idea, but without any specific baggage or connection to that culture right. and that that time that that's what irks me a bit is it's trying to use ingold and and fowler but it doesn't quite tie it into understanding you know saying what they think these these identities are for these dead people i think it's a really shaky ground though like i can imagine if i if like if i was to write this i wouldn't want to start saying um like oh well i think you know this is oh, this absolutely. and this is that and i think at the beginning it's not like at the beginning of the paper um, they do like in in their introduction. They do address that they're going to talk about three things, and those three things are, as much as I want to know what they, what this social identity is that these people are, you know, surrounded by, and what like you know who are they, and what is that social community, what is this community, it actually isn't one of the three questions that they said they were going to address. They basically kind of just said that they're going to address what materials would have played a role in such embodiment and like you know um what treatments have developed over time and it's very like and well i guess the yeah. third one would be like what is what stuff in the local environment have they used um to kind of you know put into yeah. and it is very much um this is what we're gonna do this is how i'm gonna portray it and as much as i want a little bit more i do think that in the discussion um I know that those were the three questions that they were going to address, but I would have liked to see a little bit more, not necessarily thought, but just, you know, p perhaps something, mm. perhaps this and, you know, bringing it into that's a where, that's where That's where Fowler's work is so good in some yeah. sense, because he's trying to, when he's trying to understand, for example, beads and mesolithic burials, he's, he's talking about the shells and the environments in which those shells were acquired and then used and then their significance within the burial is related to that process and we never get maybe it's too short an article but we never get they're talking about camelid fur being used but we never get a sense of well how yeah. does this relate to the environment to the animals mm -hmm. that they're exploiting to the to the to the yeah so i i, I think it's a one i would love to see a book or a series of articles that expound on this because i i've seen earlier discussions of well are there, is there some kind of relationship you know, social or symbolic relationship with particular mm -hmm. animals? Do they perceive the ancestors as being you know, part human, part animal? You know, maybe it's yeah. something like that, or maybe not. But I'd, I'd love to have seen that develop more. But it's a wonderful paper and a wonderful synthesis. And I, I, I just laid, it, it made me, as someone who's not an expert in South American prehistory, and that's why we're talking about this, because yeah. we're trying to talk about articles of, of case studies of new research that are new to us. I, I felt I, I really enjoyed this, uh, but I, I I have so many questions. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I imagine this type of thing where we we need to we need to drag them onto this podcast and 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 make them make them answer them. I have questions. You can't handle the truth. You know, have this kind of have it have it out with them. Have it out with them. You know. But seriously, it's it's a wonderful, uh, well presented. And another point for readers Very is that yeah. because it's antiquity in a UK based journal, they are publishing photographs of not only the landscape and the um, but also of the bodies themselves um yeah. so there is there is a, that's another i'm just ob observing the ethical practices of uk journals differ from other other journals elsewhere in the world where human remains won't be shown within particularly those from indigenous communities uh and on and their ancestral you know um predecessors you know you you don't get human remains displayed in other journals but they are doing it which i at least think is positive even if i don't think it's properly justified or explained because you need to see this stuff to understand it i don't know how you could yeah. understand this article without these very striking photographs even though some of them are difficult they've annotated them so you can actually work out what bits are they don't look very much like human bodies anymore uh, but they've got different yeah. you know some photograph figure three for example is um showing you sort of it just looks like a blob, a mix of different things, wigs and colour, hair, coat, coloured hair coating, facial coating, colour, nasal cavities, dress. So you get a sense of how these bodies are made up of all these different substances. Yeah, honestly, though, like I, I, I can understand why in like British antiquity, they don't want to show this stuff for, of course, you know, like ethic reason, ethical reasons. I get that. But genuinely, like looking at these pictures and having these images available really puts things into perspective and kind of like, I mean, my imagination is as good as it ever can be. But I mean, like when I would have never imagined what I'm reading to look like what I'm looking at. And I do think that, like you just said, it is such an important part of the article and it really does 
Well, just give like yeah, because they don't really look like human remains to be honest. Not anymore. Like it's just I would never have expected it to look that way. That's I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, no, but yeah, it's kind of cool actually. It's not just kind of cool; it's very cool. Like it's a really interesting paper, and like you said, it's very very well written and well thought out structure wise. And they've got uh, they've got supplementary material you can link to through the. It's a paywall journal, so but there is there is supplementary materials giving you further details about the uh, about the about the the site uh, the the data behind this. It's a, not a substantial amount, and we discussed that in a previous time about how supplementary material can really add further information for specialists uh, that's not available in the journal um, and you know it's looking at their samples and so on so th there's a lot to get lots a lot we could say further about this but you know um, I, I don't really I think there's there's lots of unanswered questions for me about the colors of the materials the textures the the yeah. animals and plants uh, the environments in which these materials are extracted and the possible meanings and also the funerary context of how these bodies are positioned and related to each other in a spatial way you don't get out of this article but it can't do everything and um you know i just i'm just craving more i want more chinchorro in my life <laughs> yeah i mean it's such a, it really is it's really i you know what i want to know i want to know more about the significance of the animals used that's what i want to know because like i don't know uh, i don't think i mean and that's just me um i don't think that in any burial and in any funeral, like things happen for a reason and people put things in place for a, for a purpose. And especially if you're doing this to like over at what, what is it? How many bodies? Like 110 bodies that they found. It's like, it's a lot of bodies. You're not just going to be, oh, okay, well today we found this animal and tomorrow we found this one. And it's obviously very structured and there is, yeah. a, there is a specific way. And I want to know why, why is it those animals? And I know that that's kind of what they're kind of getting at and what they want to look at but i would like a little bit, bit more while we have like the while we have the demographics to know that men women and children got this treatment we don't know if the whole community did or a selection yeah. particular i mean there's so many questions like that, that that need further reflection on so yes i i i think this is a famous case study and yet still there are so many unanswered questions and uh, i look forward to reading more about this topic moving forward yeah well, that's all I have to say, to be honest, <laughs> unless you have any other questions, Afnan. <laughs> Not in particular questions, just I think like when it comes to um, famous sites like this or any other famous site, I mean, like, let's just take a look at like Egyptology just because like it's such a yeah. big thing. No, like we have so much evidence and there's so much stuff, but it's there's still every single time you find something, it opens up an entirely yeah. new like can of worms and it's a it's a bunch of questions that need answering and we don't know because like that's the whole point of archaeology we we, we want to find out um and i think it's probably the same with this it is the same with this and yeah i am very interested to see how they're going to go about it and what there is for, more for me to learn because it is a very interesting and new topic for me and um I'm, yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought the other, it was super. The other thing that we do need to flag up for read listeners i suppose is that you know any study of the chinchoro has it does a job of countering the pseudo archaeologists who see a sort of global singular origin to mummification in the same way as they see a singular origin for pyramids linked to either ancient aliens or some ancient civilization that existed before the Ice Age. So any new study that's prominent about the Kinchora mummies, which do predate mummification yeah. practices in Egypt, I'm just querying whether they're the oldest type of body modification, but they're definitely the oldest form of mummification, really yeah. serves an important role. And these dates and this evidence really is important to get out there in prominent journals to counter the constant insidious misinformation and disinformation from fakers grifters and racists who are trying to peddle these 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 sort of ancient aliens and ancient you know all wise civilization narratives uh that um yeah. that will, will easily pluck the evidence of chinchoro and make crude comparisons with um, Egypt. I think that's a point we addressed in a previous po po podcast where we were trying to discuss, yeah. you know, the, the dangers of these fringe hyper diffusionist, you know, global narratives that pluck cultural information out of different millennia, different centuries, and mm. see them as part of the same phenomenon. 
but anyway, we can't do much about that. But at least these, this article is doing that work by presenting the latest information in a high profile, peer reviewed academic context. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do think it is important and I do. And I'm glad to see this kind of evidence coming out because, well, yeah, just exactly as you said, like the more there is out there, the more knowledge and the more understanding people can gain. And it, you can't just turn a blind eye to it anymore. So yeah. it is very important. So, I mean, yeah, kudos to you guys. Um, thank you for writing the paper. Excellent job. <laughs> so to Indira Monte and colleagues, well done. Thank you very much. We enjoyed reading your paper. Thank you. And, uh, Maybe we'll continue our journey into other parts of the world and other funerary practices in future episodes of Let's Talk Random Archaeology. But from me, um, cheerio for now, everyone. Yeah, see you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archaeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.